Um, you know, it's my honor today to introduce you to Quinn Early, who was a wide receiver for Iowa from 1984 to 1987. Uh, since then, he played in the NFL with the Chargers, Saints, Bills, and ended his career uh, with the Jets. In addition, he became um, a Kung Fu and Tai Chi expert and has worked as a Hollywood stuntman for some very famous names like Will Smith and as an actor, as a screenwriter as well. Quinn has written several screen screenplays, including The Angel of Harlem and The Hawkeye, which is a story of Frank Kenny Holbrook, Iowa's first black intercollegiate athlete. He also recently completed his first film, Just Big Cookies. Quinn's passion extends into advocacy for Alzheimer's awareness, and in 2019, he launched the Anne Early Intervention Foundation in memory of his mother who passed from the disease a few years ago. He also published a book that she wrote, donating the sales proceeds to benefit the fight against Alzheimer's and related illnesses. You know, it is my honor today to welcome everyone who's joining us today on the chat from the OCAP with my fellow Hawkeye and alumni, Quinn Early. Quinn, welcome to the show. How have you been? You've been busy since leaving Iowa. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me, first of all. And let me start off by giving a big fat loo. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you, Quinn. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, um, you know, I... I can't, I can't begin to tell you what an honor it is, number one, to, to take some time today and, and be interviewing you. But more importantly, I just want to say thank you for your service in terms of all the fun and creative things that you've been doing. It's, it, it's, I, I can't wait to dive into some of the questions because I'm just so um, impressed with the work that you've been doing over the years um, of leading up to today that we'll, we'll talk about here shortly. You know, um, I have a bunch of questions for you, uh, along with some audience questions that we'll get to shortly. But uh, in preparing for the day, I, I went and I asked a couple of your old teammates and some folks around the community that knew the name Quinn Early. And, and here's some words that continue to resonate. Pioneer, leader, renaissance man smooth, <laughs> driven, determined, focused, competitor, well-liked, respected, innovative, larger than life, and Hawkeye legend. What is your initial response to those words? Um, what do you attribute that positivity to? And how has those words impacted your personal perception and how has it played out in your real life? Well, first of all, let me start by saying how extremely humbled I am um, that people view me in that manner. Um, I've always just been a person to work as hard as I could, try to reach my goals. And the biggest thing that I think I've learned in life is to always be kind and respect others. You know, it's the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And that's pretty much how I've tried to live my life. Now, as far as my work ethic and all that stuff, where that comes from, it definitely comes from my mother, Dr. Ann Early, who, as you mentioned, you know, she passed away, unfortunately, in 2013 from Alzheimer's. But, you know, it was more her actions than it was her words. I watched as, you know, my father left when I was about 13 years old, and my mother was a housewife. And instead of, you know, imploding and going into herself, she rolled up her sleeves and she went out and she got her bachelor's degree, her master's degree, and then her PhD. And my mother was a doctor. So what that instilled in me was when times are hard, you roll your sleeves up and you work hard to achieve your goal. So I've always taken that with me and everything that I've tried to achieve. And, uh, and it's been great. And I have to tell you that um, being able to have the experience that I had at Iowa was one of the most phenomenal experiences I've ever had. I, I made the best friends I've ever had. Um, you know, the ups and downs of transitioning from a teenager into manhood, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. 
on and off the football field, some of the mentors that I've had, you know, I, I hear the horror stories about some people when they go to college and it's just turmoil all over the place. But I think that you and I both know that we were extremely fortunate to be able to play for a man like Hayden Fry. Yeah. And the fact that he was more than a coach, he was more of a mentor, a father figure. And he instilled that in his other coaches. And why, while we might not have always liked our position coaches, right? <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day right them as a collective they helped yeah. fold us into the men that we are so i'm just very um appreciative and humbled and uh just thankful for the whole experience yeah so i have to ask um how did a teenager from new york end up attending iowa in the early 80s that's a good that's a good question i so uh, once i started getting recruited you know for for sports uh, my first experience really was, you know, I was in the classroom, you know, that black phone that hangs in the classroom, <laughs> that rang, the teacher looks at me, and I was like, oh, man, you know, what did I do? Right, you know, right. Chances <laughs> were I probably did do something. You know? So they told me to go to the office. I went, and Coach Fry, Bill Snyder, and Bernie Wyatt, who was the uh, coordinator, the East Coast coordinator, were yep. sitting, and they wanted me to you know, come take a visit and, and perhaps be a student athlete at Iowa. So that was my first experience uh, in meeting them. Now, when I went for my visit, there were a lot of guys from the East Coast there at the time. You know, there was Norm Granger, mm -hmm. Creer, and Devon Mitchell. Like, I can go on and on. And so I was intrigued by that. The other thing was they had a good art school. Uh, as a lot of people know, like, I'm an artist. I, you know, got my degree in commercial art. Uh, so that was a plus. And one of the big things was the fact that growing up, I was a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. So Iowa had those Steeler uniforms, you know, <laughs> 18, that's yeah. I'm right. like, I'm rocking that uniform. You know what I mean? So I think it was, uh, I think as a collective, it was all of those things that uh, yeah. made me make my choice. But a, a, another one of the factors, which was huge, was Coach Fry never promised me, you're going to be a superstar, we're going to do this. You know, he didn't even really talk football. Mm -hmm. Talked to my mom about the importance of, being a good student and having responsibility for yourself. All of the things basically that she taught me is what he was speaking. So that was a huge plus. So I think all of those things were, were factors in me choosing Iowa. You know, when you arrived in Iowa City, the corn belt of the country, mm -hmm. what were your first impressions? I, now, I'm from Waterloo. I've been here. I've grown up here. I, yeah. I, know, I know the culture. I know the environment. What was it like for an East Coast? guy coming to the corn belt of, of of the country right from the big city life yeah yeah so when i first got there it was definitely culture shock in terms of how friendly everybody was good morning how are you today <laughs> and you know there was a couple of times when people would say stuff to me i'm walking down the street and i'm thinking like i'm gonna get jumped or something, right? <laughs> right um and even like i remember going to the quick trip there on campus and seeing people um, pull up in their car, they would get out and they would pump gas before they even paid for the thing. <laughs> and then they would go inside and leave their car running and go inside and pay. And I was like, how was that even possible? You know? <laughs> and another thing was, I remember walking uh, you know, to class and just stopping and staring on the, on the corner. There was a small patch of grass and there were two giant stalks of corn and I just remember standing there looking at this thing going, what, that's corn right there, you know? So it was definitely, but it was definitely a culture shock. But man, I, I loved it. Loved it. Oh, oh, fantastic. Well, we're, we're certainly honored and glad that you chose the University of Iowa, and in particular coming out here to Iowa City. Uh, you know, you just had a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. So I'm glad to hear that. Now, you've worked with some legendary coaches at Iowa and played on some amazing teams during your time at Iowa. Mm -hmm. Any memorable experiences, any memorable games, stories, funny, unique stories to tell about either coaches or games that you played in? Sure, sure. So I remember um, one of the big ones was uh, my junior year right about a week before the first game, I was returning, a, we were scrimmaging, I returned to kickoff, and I think I scored a touchdown, I was out of breath, I came back. Um, I told coach, you know, I, uh, can I get a blow, I'm kind of tired. He said, uh, 
uh, just take one more and you'll be good. So I'm returning the kick and I, I separate my shoulder. So I missed the first half of my junior year that year. Oh, wow. And, you know, of course I was devastated. And yep. the very first game I came back, we were playing Northwestern at home. And uh, my brother had come out to visit and he was at the game and it was just a torrential downpour. I mean, it was just cast right. And we were on our own five yard line, seven yard line, whatever it was. We were down on our end of the end zone and Mark Vlasic threw me a long ball and I took it in for a touchdown. And that was my first, I think it was my first catch of my junior year. And it was like game six. So wow. I, had, I felt like I had some catching up to do. <laughs> so I caught that ball and I went for a touchdown. And man, that, that memory always sticks with me. Another one, which was huge, is when we were number one and Michigan was number two. Yeah. I know that most people from those times and from Iowa will remember that. And when Rob Houtland kicked that game-winning field goal at the end and everybody stormed the field. And, you know, it was just a phenomenal experience, you know, to be a part of that. Um, now, as far as funny stories, you know, there's some I could tell, there's some I can't tell, right? This is, <laughs> right. This is a family friendly <laughs> show. Right? But I, uh, one of the biggest things, I don't know how funny this story is, but I always tell the story because it, it, it kind of helped to mold who I am. My very first game that I suited up for, we were going uh, to play Penn State at Penn State, and we were getting on the team bus. And, uh, I got there, you know, in plenty of time. Was five, we were five, six minutes before we were going to leave, and I got on the bus. But as you know, mm -hmm. in football, if you're five minutes early, you're 15 <laughs> minutes late, right? So I walk on the bus, and there's Coach Fry sitting in the front of the bus. And, you know, he had those aviator sunglasses right, on. Right, right. And when I walked on the bus, he pulled those things down, and he looked at me, you know, over those things. And he watched me get on the bus and walk by, and my heart pounded out of my chest. <laughs> and I have to tell you, Lou, from that day on, I've never been late for anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm always 20 minutes, a yeah. half an hour. And I just think that's a good way to be anyway, right? But right. that was something that he said without saying it. Yep. So yep. That's one thing that always stuck with me. So uh, that's amazing. You know, I, I'd like to, you know, for the sake of time, I'd like to move on to another part of your life, which is obviously your career, your fascinating career. But before I do that, in um, one just last question, but before, it, what ways has Iowa helped prepare you for your post-collegiate athletic career? And are there any parallels uh, into your acting and Hollywood career as well that you learned from Iowa? Absolutely. So I think, first and foremost, the biggest thing that I learned when at Iowa was follow-through. And what I mean when I say follow-through is finishing school, getting your degree. You know, I was, you know, two of my best friends were uh, Robert Smith and Kerry Burt. Yep. When we were freshmen, we all got together and we all decided that we were going to hold each other accountable to go to school and get our degrees. And that's exactly what we did. Um, you know, and it, it's funny because sometimes when I walk into my office at home and I see my uh, diploma there, sometimes I'll say to myself, how'd that happen? <laughs> right. Right. Because I wasn't the best student, but I worked hard and I got it done. Mm -hmm. And the parallel to football is, is much the same. When I got there, I wasn't sure that I was going to make it. You know, I was an 18-year-old kid. I was 170 pounds soaking wet. And, you know, I questioned myself, can I make it here? Can I play with these mm -hmm. guys? This is big time mm -hmm. football. And the one thing I did was I worked as hard as I could. Again, not always the biggest, not always the strongest, not always maybe even the, the most talented or athletic, but I worked as hard as I can. And I will say that I feel like I worked hard, as hard or harder than everybody else. That's just how I approached it. Right. And after I graduated from, from college, when I got to the NFL, I just tried to apply what I always did. And that's work hard. You know, I always told myself, I'm going to have the best practice I ever had today mm -hmm. when, I, when I walk through that fence. And some days it wouldn't have happened, but I always worked towards that. And then that way, when game day came around, it was, it was easier than those practices. And, you know, I've, I've tried to always apply that in life. And I'll tell you, in, in, in my stunt career, it's really the same thing, you know. And I'll tell you, one of the biggest parallels between football and stunts is the camaraderie yeah. uh, with the other stunt performers. 
you know, there's jokes and we're laughing and we have a good time. You know, we might go out and have a, a drink or something after the, the job is done. But when they yell action, you got to you have to do the thing and you have yep. to do the job and you have to do it well. Right. Because the more takes they do, the more money it's costing them. And they're going, what's this guy doing? Right. right. So it's the same kind of thing. So I've always tried to take the work ethic and the hard work into everything that I've done. And it's, you know, and, and by the grace of God, it's helped me to be successful. Certainly. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, when we talk about your career, uh, what was it like to be drafted into the NFL? And what was that first NFL touchdown like? Oh my God. Did you do the, Did you do a dance or? I mean, <laughs> I, what, what was your thing, Quinn? I mean, would you just hand the ball to the ref? I mean, what? What, what was that like? Well, tell if us I, about that experience. If I did do a dance, I you know don't ask me to demonstrate it. Okay? <laughs> but no, I, I so when I got drafted, I got dra drafted by the San Diego Chargers in the third round, and I was so excited about it because you know I, I told my mom when I was seven years old, my first year playing football, I told her I was going to play in the NFL. You know, and she patted me on the head. Oh, that's nice, dear. Yeah, right. So, and obviously, there's a lot of factors that allow, you know, that to happen. But, you know, once I was drafted, I was super excited. I was super anxious. I, I was so happy. But I also realized that now the work begins, right? Because you can get invited to the dance, but you have to dance once you get there, right? Right, um, right. But I do remember my very first preseason game. We were playing, I believe it was the, the Dallas Cowboys. And first I put my uniform on and I just stood in front of the mirror. It, it felt like I stood there for about <laughs> 10 minutes, right? But I'm just looking at myself in a San Diego Chargers uniform, like, and all those memories of how hard I worked and all that stuff came flooding back. Then when we went onto the football field and we were warming up and I looked up and, you know, there goes Tom Landry. There's Tony Dorsett. <laughs> Yeah. Everson Walls, like all of these old time, these Cowboys players that I grew up and those guys were my hero. Right. And then when I lined up and Everson Walls was covering me and he's calling me all kinds of names. <laughs> and I'm right. smiling from, I'm smiling from <laughs> ear to ear. I'm like, Everson Wall just called me a so and so. You know what I mean? And right, I'm, right, I'm, right. <laughs> and I was just so happy to be out there. So just the whole process of getting drafted, uh, putting that uniform on being able to play against some of my childhood heroes. Um, it was just, a, I, it's, I can't even really explain how amazing yeah. that was. Now, I, I was reading somewhere where you mentioned, or maybe it was a comment that you made, that Lynn Swan mm -hmm. was, quote unquote, one of your favorite players. Yeah. Is that correct? Absolutely. It, how, did, how did his play impact how you played the wide receiver role in the NFL? Well, like you said, he was one of my heroes coming up. And that's why, you know, in high school, I wore number 88. And then, you know, for most of my, my NFL career, a part of my NFL career, I wore number 88. Um, just how he played the game. Yeah. Obviously, I didn't see the off the field stuff. But man, on Sundays, just how he would just jump, like the, the acrobatics and all that stuff. You know, it was, he was kind of before his time with that. Mm -hmm. you know, and there were definitely other guys, right? But me being a big Pittsburgh Steeler fan growing up, I definitely zeroed in on him and how he played. Right. And, uh, you know, I would be in the backyard. Lynn Swan, you know, and I would jump and try to, you know, <laughs> right. do all you know, acrobatic <laughs> stuff. And, uh, you know, so that always just stuck with me. And, and, and yeah, he's definitely was all, he was always a role model. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. Um, real quick, um, what was it like for you, you know, after your NFL career, you went on to stunt doubling? Mm -hmm. how did that come to be how did that how did that happen in your life how did that evolve so one of my former teammates uh bill perkins uh he did really well in business after college and uh you know he went he worked on wall street um you know jumping to the end you know he's now a hedge fund manager he's done extremely well and uh as a passion he began movie producing mm -hmm. so around 2010 he calls me and he goes, hey, come be in my movie this weekend. And I was like, I, I guess so. You know, I wasn't doing anything. I'm like, All right. So I jumped on the plane. I went and the movie was filmed in Louisiana. Next thing I know, I'm hanging out the back of a truck and I'm shooting a machine gun. And then they and then at the end of the week, they gave me a check. And I was like, you I get paid for this. 
I would have paid them <laughs> to hang out the back. <laughs> right, right. So I became friends with the stunt coordinator and I asked him, how do I do this as a profession? So he basically gave me the blueprint and uh, I just followed his guidance and I started doing the stuff. And then, you know, so I made that movie. And then the next year I made my second movie and then it gradually started picking up, picking up, picking up. And, and here I am today. And, uh, you know, I'm extremely um, happy that that happened. And I just love what I do. So it's a, that was a great experience. Wow. Speaking of which, and just to kind of follow up with that, what was it like to jump out of a helicopter as Will Smith's <laughs> stunt double? I mean, Scary. I mean, come on. You got to give us some insight. Give us some inside info, man. Craziest thing I've ever done. That's for sure. So uh, the stunt coordinator for that, he knew that I had doubled Will Smith on a couple of other projects. So he calls me and he says, hey, uh, I know that you double Will sometimes. Would you be interested in... Um, doing this stunt somebody had double i mean somebody had uh dared him for his 50th birthday to bungee jump out of a helicopter but not just bungee jump out of a helicopter but bungee jump out of a helicopter into the grand canyon <laughs> he said would you be interested in testing that for him so before i could even think about it it was like my mouth just blurted before my mind could think i said yeah i'll do it when I got off the phone with him, I just stared at the wall for like five minutes. Like, what did I just agree to? Right, right. And uh, so I did it twice. We went to Simi Valley, which is in Los Angeles at a rock quarry. And I met with the bungee jump team and, you know, everybody. And then the helicopter was up in the air. And first thing they did was they dropped a dummy out of the helicopter. So I'm watching this helicopter. It's 400 feet up in the air. The thing was like this big. And all of a sudden I see this thing come out of the helicopter and it was this dummy. And the thing is that... And then when they went to bring it down, the thing was slapping all over the ground. I, mean, I don't like that. I just, I don't like that, you know? And then um, it was my turn. We go up and I'm facing into the helicopter. So just like I'm facing you and my, I'm standing on the skid of the helicopter and my hands are inside and I can see the pilot. There was a gentleman to my right and he's holding the bungees. There was a gentleman to my left. He had me hooked in so I wouldn't fall before it was time. Uh, we get up there, we get up to 400 feet and I'm not looking, I'm not looking, I'm looking at a spot on the floor. I don't want to, I didn't want to know. Right. He unhooks me. The guy with the bungees drops the bungees out and they do the countdown, you know, three, two, one. And I went backwards out of this helicopter and I'm watching the helicopter as I'm like, I feel like I'm falling <laughs> to my death right now. And I'm like, right. oh my God, oh my God. And then when I get to the bottom, I slowed down. I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was like, it, so it was the scariest thing I've ever done, but it was also the most awesome thing I've ever done. Right. Then you fast forward to a couple of weeks later, we go to uh, Arizona, we go to the Grand Canyon and I did it again at the Grand Canyon. Then I went and I explained to Will, this is what you do. This is how it works, you know? And you know, we had a conversation and then it was his turn to do it. Um, so he said the exact same thing when he was done. I was like, how was it? He said it was the craziest thing, but it was the most awesome thing. You know, then it was like right. it was one of those movies that ends with us both jumping like in a high five. <laughs> right, you know? right. But yeah, no, it, was, it, was, it was an awesome experience. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm thankful that I had a chance to. And oh, and the biggest part about it is the fact that I don't like heights. Oh, wow. So that was a chance for me to overcome my fear. Yeah. So if you called me just some weekend and said, yo, Quinn, let's go bungee jumping this weekend. I'd be like, are you crazy? <laughs> right. You know, so it's nothing that I would normally do. Like, I would not, I'm not really trying to do it again, but I, it was definitely an awesome experience. Certainly, certainly. Great. And now you're, you're doing some work with Star Trek. Can you let us a little bit more into kind of what that project looks like and, sure. and, and, and give me some, give us some insight into that? Sure, sure. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm calling, you know, I'm talking to you from this hotel room. Uh, so I'm up at Santa Clarita, Santa Clarita Studios, um, which is a little past LA right there. And I'm working on Star Trek Picard. And uh, they brought me in, they're doing, uh, I don't want to get too detailed in it, because I might be violating right. something. But right. uh, it's a thing where there's just, a, there's a lot of martial arts type, you know, sword fighting and stuff like that, and things like that. So I'm really excited to be a part of it. And I'm here for the next couple of weeks. So um, it's just a really fun project. Great. You know, I'd like to, to take an opportunity to, to maybe move on a little bit here for the sake of time and discuss some of your current projects that you're on and, and tell us, 
a little bit about how and why your work with the Alzheimer's organizations and foundations kind of came to be? And what are you hoping to accomplish with this important work? Absolutely. So to go back to the beginning, uh, you know, we talked about the fact that I started Alzheimer's Foundation, the Ann Early Intervention Foundation, uh, in honor of my late mother, Dr. Ann Early. You know, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2008. And uh, unfortunately, she passed away in 2013 from the disease. But during her time, uh, when she was going through her journey, I was her primary caregiver. She gave me this manuscript, and it was a book about our family history. Um, mm -hmm. She tried to tell me about this during my NFL career. But, you know, you know, when you're young and you're in your career, and I was like, what are you doing, mom? I was like, oh, you know, I was more, I was more worried about, you know, my hair and the rims of my car. Than <laughs> right. I was. So uh, when she gave me the manuscript in 2008, she asked me if I would have her book published. And it's about my great grandfather, a man named Sherrod Bryant, who was a free man of color during this, during the time of slavery in the antebellum South. He sold himself into indentured servitude and then went on to become one of the wealthiest landowners in the South. And this is a true story. Wow. So I had the book published for her and 100% of those proceeds from the book, I give to the foundation to help raise money for Alzheimer's. But what happened was after I read the book, I just started typing out this thing. I typed out this, you know, what I thought was a movie script. I took it to somebody. They said, congratulations, you have a beginning, a middle and an end. And then they told me how crappy the script was just because I didn't know what I was doing. Right? <laughs> right. So, uh, a really good friend of mine from that we grew up together, uh, Darren Perosi. He lives in California. Also, he started showing me how to be a screenwriter. So I started writing. So I wrote that script. Then I wrote Angel of Harlem. Then I learned about Frank Kenny Holbrook. Right? We 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 know about him. <laughs> he just got inducted into the Athletic Hall of Fame. So at first, I wrote a screenplay based on his life. But I knew that his story needed to be told. So I created the documentary. The Shoulders of Giants, The Life and Times of Frank Kenny Holbrook. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm extremely happy with it and excited about that documentary. And I've created a whole documentary series from there. So uh, I have my screenwriting. I have my documentaries. So ultimately, my goal is to be able to make my own full-length feature films. I love doing stunts. I love that stuff. But, you know, truth be told, I'm not the youngest guy. <laughs> Right. And, you know, getting thrown through a plate glass window isn't quite feeling as <laughs> awesome as it once did, right? So, you know, my goal is to, over the next few years, transition from stunts completely into producing and writing and making my own content. So that's what I'm in the process of doing right now. Oh, fantastic. And, and you know, what, a, what, a, what an experience that you've had. I mean, just, the, just hearing these stories of, of the, the life that you've had up to this point from the NFL to your college career to the stunt double, the folks that you've met, you know, in, in the various professions that you have. I mean, what, what, a, what an experience this has been. Speaking of, of that, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned Frank Kenny Holbrook, first at Black uh, athlete at the University of Iowa. How did that impact your experience in your life as an also as an Af African American athlete at the University of Iowa. So, how did his story impact your life and experiences as a black athlete? I have to tell you that you know, when I was at Iowa, you know, I lived in Slater Hall. Yep. Right, but had no idea who that was. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, quite frankly, again, like I was saying about my hair and the rims, you know, I was more worried about, you know, what I was doing, you know, what I was doing on the football field and then in my free time and trying to meet girls and, you know, yeah. doing all that stuff. Right. So right. as you get older and you start to feel your own mortality a little bit, history becomes more important. Mm -hmm. And when I first found out about Frank Kenny Holbrook and totally randomly found him just clicking around on Google and there was a picture I didn't know what that picture was. I just said, wow, there's like a black kid at the, in the corner of this picture. I clicked on it. It was that 1895 Iowa Hawkeye football team. And I was like, what? And mm -hmm. so instantly, you know, I started doing research. And I was like, and then when I started to ask, you know, friends and former coaches and just people, you know, from the university about him, it was amazing to me that a lot of people didn't even know who he was. Right. So 
that's when I wrote the screenplay. And then as I started working on the documentary and, and, you know, and listen, I'm not saying that it was because of me, because there's, there's these amazing people around me that helped me with this documentary who knew all about Frank Kenny Holbrook mm -hmm. and had some great stuff to say about Frank Kenny Holbrook and just gave me an education on him. So when I started doing the research and I started doing these things, it was emotional for me. Yeah. Really, I can imagine. It was really emotional for me. You know, he grew up in a town, Tipton is where he was from. And his family, they were accepted in that town. And, uh, you know, they were Quakers back then. And Quakers, you know, ultimately believed that all men truly were created equal. They didn't see color. So when it was time for him to get a scholarship to Iowa, they, the family couldn't afford it. So they all, the townspeople all pulled their money together to send him to Iowa. And then, you know, as he was at Iowa, you know, obviously, you know, he started to face like the racism and you know, he had to find housing. He couldn't eat at the same restaurants, these types of things. And then he really felt it when they traveled south to play teams like Missouri. Um, you know, so just the, the seriousness of what he had to go through and to be the first, you mm -hmm. know, that just, to me, that's why I called it the shoulders of giants, right? Um, you know, it's a, a quote from Sir Isaac Newton. It says, if I have seen further than others, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. Meaning that Frank Kenny Holbrook set the precedent. And as, you know, the, the Duke Slater and more black athletes started attending Iowa, you know, and everybody realized that things had to change and things had to progress. And as they progressed and got better, you know, things like that, right? I mean, there's always work to do, but, you know, they set the tone you know, for you and I to be able to be as successful as we've been. Right, right. Well, Quinn, I tell you, what an amazing life you've had and along with the, with the journey of, of coming to Iowa and playing for the University of Iowa and all the things that you've done. I want to I wanna give you an opportunity. Is there any questions that maybe you you want would like us to talk about that we haven't mentioned at least in our in the questions that I've asked so far anything you'd like to elaborate on a little bit more um well I you know first of all thank you again for having me and you're doing a phenomenal job and you've covered pretty much all of it right I, I mean that's you know that's a lot you know I just it's just really important to me um to tell these stories you know I have a um a meeting coming up with a streaming service. I, again, I don't want to divulge too much, but we're talking about them funding my documentary series, which is called This Is One. And it's kind of a play on words. You know, it, it starts off, I always say, you know, what if I told you that the story you've never heard would be the one you'll always remember? And then I say, I'm Quinn Early and this is one. It's kind of a play on words because I want number mm -hmm. one in college, right? Right. So the next documentary that I'm working on is the relationship, uh, oh, and, and, and just to go back a little bit. So what I'm focusing on is black pioneers in American sports history whose stories you haven't heard or have yet to be told. And the next story that I'm talking about, and I think a lot of you know the Hawkeye fans are gonna appreciate this, is the relationship between Hayden Fry and Jerry Levias, who was the <laughs> first black player to get a scholarship which Coach Fry gave him yep. in 1965 in the Southwestern Conference. Um, it's a, again, it's an amazing story. I'm actually, you know, well into this documentary and, and you know, it's going to be a great story. And it just shows really the man, Hayden Fry. You know, he grew up in Odessa, Texas. He was the Marine. He was the father. He was the coach. He was the mentor. All of the things that we experienced with him. And the fact that the relationship that he had with Jerry Levias, you know, when I was at his funeral in 2019, Coach Fry, and they were showing home movies of his family and his children. And Jerry Levias was right there. And I know how close they were, how close Jerry was with the family. You know, and it's, it, it's <laughs> I was doing an interview with Kelly Fry, Coach Fry's son, and Kelly said that Jerry was so close with the family, they named their dog Levi after him, right? Wow. <laughs> so, and he babysit those kids. And right. they said that, you know, 
uh, Coach Fry and Jerry Levice would speak once a week, all the way up until Coach Fry passed away. And it's just wow. an amazing, it's just an amazing story. So my goal is to be able to tell, and not just in Iowa, but just um, these stories in general, and not just football, but, you know, all the different sports mm -hmm. and things like that. So I'm really excited to be doing this project. And uh, hopefully I can get something going with this, you know, the streaming service and, you know, everybody will be able to enjoy these, these projects. And again, my, my main goal is to eventually be able to make full length feature films um, that tell, again, these important stories. So yeah, that's, that's, well, the, that's yeah, those, well, the, the, the stories, I mean, these are critical stories. And I think this is, you know, we're a time in our country now where, you know, um, you know, there's opportunity for, you know, people of color to, to be recognized for some of the things that they've done uh, historically and here at the University of Iowa. Um, I do have one just final question for you. Okay. Um, throughout both your college and NFL career, have you ever known a fullback to return a kickoff more than 13 yards? Well, I got to tell you, man, um, when he said that stat, I was super impressed. <laughs> <laughs> now, just let me ask you a question real quick. Did you juke? Or did you just try to like just run some people over? Well, I was, I think I was the, you know, you got the two deep guys and then you got the guy in the middle and then you got, you got kind of a second layer and then you got your first layer. I think I was the guy in the middle and they, they kicked it too short. It got caught up in the wind. Yeah. And I went back a couple steps too far because I was going to get me a kick return in the kick return slot box before yeah, yeah. I left Iowa. Yeah. So, <laughs> That, I, I I can cross that off my bucket list when yeah. because uh, I got my 13 yard return. It's forever will go down. I know I talked to Norm Granger a few times and he says, you know, I'm the only fullback to take a kickoff back like 99 yards or something like that. <laughs> I was like, oh, Norm, <laughs> my man. So anyway, yeah. Quinn, thank you so much, man. This has just been extremely insightful. Um, Continued success, my man, on, on your continued amazing career. Um, love what you're doing. Love uh, always chatting with you. I think at this point in time, if there's any questions from our folks that are joining us remotely, I'd like to get those addressed um, uh, from a Q&A perspective, if you have a couple more minutes with us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, let me see if I can go to our chat box. See what we got here. And Q&A. All right. Um, this one says, uh, Quinn, with all of your accolades, how do you remain so humble? Well, I'm going to recite a uh, quote from a really famous and well-versed um, character in history and that quote says I am what I am and that's all that I am you know who said that Popeye the Sailor Popeye the Sailor Man wow that's what <laughs> <laughs> no so no, no I, it's, I just, it's great listen, no I, I, I again like we talked about in the beginning it's all about um, just being humble doing unto others as you would have others do unto you. And I've never been, you know, I've always just been Quinn. I, I'm extremely proud of the things that I've done, but I've always just, you know, it's a rolling your sleeves up and working hard. And then at the end of the day, I'm just people. We're yeah. all just, we're all just people. Nobody's better, you know, and every now and then, you know, like even like in the industry that I work on, you know, sometimes you'll see, some of the actors and, you know, it's like they're larger than life and things like that. But to me, they're just people. And that's really just how I look at it. And what kind of person are you? Right. You know what I mean? So I, I just, at the end of the day, I'm just Quinn. Uh, I'm no better than anybody else, you know, and you could be the, listen, you could be the janitor at the junior high school. If you're a good dude, I'm hanging out with, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. You, know, you could be the king of wherever 
And if you're a jerk, then I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, so that's really the bottom line. Well, I, you know, I've, I've gotten this question asked to me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to return it back to you as okay. well. What is your favorite hate and fry saying that you've heard him say? Oh, um, well, there's ton. Of, I know there's tons of them. Sure. But sure. What's, what's your favorite saying? He said oh. one and he said, you know, you know how somebody cheap shots you or something happens or you, you know, the ref throws a flag or, you know what I mean? And then you're getting angry, you're getting upset, right? So one thing Coach Fry would say is he said, and actually Jerry LeVice told me this. He used to say to him, he said, um, if you don't want him to get your goat, don't let him know where it's hid. <laughs> right? So basically he's saying, don't let, <laughs> don't let, don't let somebody else dictate how you're right. going react right don't let anybody right. you and stuff so and there are so as you know man there are so yeah many there's, there's a ton of them I, and, and a lot of times you'd say it and every we'd all like look around <laughs> at each other like what does that even mean right, it's right? Like, <laughs> and the funny thing about it is he would start laughing about it you yeah. crack yourself up sometimes yeah. Yeah. um uh next real quick question and we'll just answer just a few of these okay um this person says, I was honored to recently win a silent auction of Quinn's screenplay, The Hawkeye, and once I started reading it, I couldn't put it down. I can't wait to see it on the big screen. Besides Mr. Holbrook and Duke Slater, are there other African-American Iowa players who we as fans don't know about? Oh, my goodness. There are so many. There are so many. Um, I mean, and not just in football. But in other sports, mm -hmm. right? there's wrestling, and some of these names I can't, um, I can't really think of right now. Sure. I just know the stories. But I'm going to tell you, you know, uh, Ted Wheeler was my track coach. You know, I ran track yep. and football at Iowa, and uh, man, what a phenomenal man! Love the guy. Uh, yep. He was a great coach, and he was, you know, again a pioneer. You know, he ran track for Iowa. A long, long time ago. And same thing, you know, he went through some things and, you know, that's just one yeah. example, but there were just so many. And hopefully I get to tell more of these stories so that people can learn about yeah. the history of, of the black athlete at the University of Iowa. Yeah. In fact, there's a book and I can't remember the, the, their names. They were professors at Iowa. It's called, um, I believe, The Hidden Hawkeye. Mm. And it talks about all of the you know, the black pioneers in, in uh, Iowa Hawkeye sports history. So that might be something that, you know, the yeah. person who's asking uh, the question uh, can look into that as well. One last question that we'll get to before we wrap up today is um, you've managed to fulfill all, most of you, if not all of your dreams that you've had and goals that you've set for yourself, which has been extremely impressive. You know, playing in the NFL, uh, being a kung fu master, stuntman, and now a writer, screenplay, all that good stuff. Are there any other dreams that you haven't achieved yet? Any other dreams that I haven't achieved yet? Dreams or goals that you haven't achieved yet? Well, you know, earlier uh, we were talking about dance, and um, I'd love to be like some sort of dance star, mm. but I don't think that's going to happen. No, they, I'm getting a little, like I said, I'm getting a little long in the tooth. So, you know, I'm, I'm pulling hamstrings <laughs> these days. I'm trying to do too much. You know what I mean? But I'm just kidding. But no, no. I, you know, I, I'll tell you the one thing that I have, I fantasize a little bit about is as an old guy, being able to maybe just open a Kung Fu school and just teach the kids after school. I, no. I have, a, um, you know, I have my students. I teach at the Kung Fu school where I trained, you know, pretty much my whole adult life. But I have a, a little girl that her mom brings to my house once a week and I teach her Kung Fu and it just brings me so much joy. So I mm -hmm. think that uh, that's one thing at, at some point, once I'm retired, maybe I'll, uh, I'll open like a little martial arts school and just teach, teach Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Well, fantastic. And the word on the street, and I'm here in Iowa City, is that they said Quinn Early can cut a rug at the field house. <laughs> <laughs> So that told you that. That. Who told I'm, just gonna, you? I'm just going to drop the mic on that one, buddy. <laughs> oh, my God. You so totally got me on that oh one. Oh, my gosh. So well, funny. Quinn, thank you so much for your time today. It is 
truly, truly been a pleasure. Please stay in touch. Um, I, I, you know, I know you and I know how to connect with each other, but uh, continue the great work, man. I'm proud of you, and and you're such a great example for our young people, young athletes, as well as future uh, writers, actors, stunt people. Uh, keep up the good work, my brother. Thanks, Lou. I'm proud of you as well. Great. Thank you all. Thanks for joining. Have a great day.